Hey, I'm Mike Tyson. I'm here with Mr. Snoop Dogg. We're getting fucked up. That is a fact. That's an actual fact, Jack. And yeah, you can bet on that. Lennox Lewis, Evander Holyfield. What about them? Which one gave you the most problems? Fucking um, Holyfield. We are worst critics, you know that, right? Absolutely, because we see bad shit. I made it, right? And then you want more. It's something else you want. There's always something else you want. You want more. The hypnotism was a part of that, too. It's hard, yeah. He controlled. He controlled. Intelligent, savage animal, yeah. That's crazy how hip hop and boxing and sports are so connected. It all needs each other. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you inside the GGN News Network. I'm your host with the most fun, Nemo, aka Nemo Hoes. And today I got the motherfucking champ on the show. Yes, sir. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. What's Always happening, Iron Mike? You. What's up, baby? Nothing, man. I came to here smoke with you and express some of these new companies I'm building. I man. see you, man. You popping. You got the ranch companies popping off. Let's talk about a couple of them right now. Yeah, we got the copper gel. This is for aches and stuff. If you finish working out and you're fucked up, you ate this. Go deep down and set all your muscles, clean you up, get is all it like the a cream? out of you. No, no, it's um, a doll rubs on you. Oh, okay. You, you rub it on the yeah. where you actually hurting that. Yeah. You brought yeah. some of the products with you today? I put, I put the flower today for you. Oh, wow. Well, that's the shit. We can damn sure yeah. try that out right now. The flower game. That's what this was in this little bowl right here, huh? Yes. I see you got some glassware. This is yours, too? Yeah, absolutely. In addition, um, I don't know, that's probably one of the first editions that come out. This shit out. hit hard, too. Nigga, I hit this motherfucker before we got on the air and damn near fell out. I had to run into another room and grab my second set of lungs. I'm always glad to please you, though, brother. I love that part of the game, though. You always do that. That's what you've been doing since day one. What made you decide to start doing <clears throat> business other than boxing business? Um, I was doing a movie um, with my partner, Rod Hickman, and my brother-in-law was discussing with him about the weed business. My brother-in-law had um, a, two or three stores, and so he discussed it, and he found out that wasn't the right thing to do. So they went into more discussing um, distribution, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, around the world. And um, Rob, saw, Rob thought that was a good idea, and they brought it to me, and I thought it was a no-brainer, and I decided I wanted to do it, wanted to, I wanted yeah. to be down with that. Because you, you're so global, so it's like, business-wise, you know, you can reach regions and parts of the world that the average... And it's not so interesting that you say that, because when I go to Europe somewhere and I want to go buy some weed, and I go in the store and they got the plants. You got to wait till the plants develop to get your weed. I said, it's what like this it's slow process, yeah. but now by what you're doing, and by becoming legal everywhere, you'll be able to have your product in countries where they love you. Now they're going to love your product, and it makes it an easy sell for you. That's brilliant business right there, Mike. What have you been up to, man, with your product? Man, I've been, I'm in Canada right now trying to oh, figure man, it out. I'm awesome. over there trying to put some things together. It's a hotel, a nice hotel in Canada. Canada's a little bit more ahead of the game than, than over yeah, here. Right. They understand what's going on. Their lawmakers are a little bit you know, more in tune. Why do you think they're afraid over here? I don't think they're afraid. I think that um, they can't maximize all of the money right now. And they need to gain control. Because I don't the think cash that, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. They, they want to gain more of the control before they actually do it. Because you can't really monitor it until you take that away. But I don't think they should take it away. I think they should leave every level of the game. Because it's business. It doesn't affect nothing. That level doesn't affect this level. Because your level and my level, we're going outside of yeah. the normal realm. We're going global. What's the best herb that you smoke since you've been doing this cannabis thing? Because I know everybody give it to you now, left and right. Well, um, I like sour diesel. You like sour diesel? Yeah. Damn. I like sour diesel. Damn, I wouldn't expect that. You like it in a joint or backwood? Backwood. But they don't be rolling backwards for you. Nice blunt. I see that they be rolling the motherfucking joints. I'm gonna have to get you my guy if we be having them already pre rolled for you. So you don't have to be stuck for the I appreciate that. Watch this. You need the lighter? <laughs> Watch this right here, though. Already rolled up. Already rolled up. Yeah, that's what we need. Yeah. Already rolled up. Already rolled up. Yeah, we're gonna check it out. Yeah. 
All you gotta do is pop the top and put some fire at the end of it. You ain't got time to be rolling up nothing. You the champ. So, so Snoop, tell me, man. This side where you see where the cut is at? It's easy if you do it right there on the line right there. Show me, show me. Bang, right there on the line. Oh, you push beautiful. you up right there. That's beautiful. Snatch you more out of there. Hello. Mm. Teamwork make a dream work. Hey, tell me, did you miss those good times in Death Row? I know we had some help, but those were some good times, I though. I miss those great times in Death Row. I got a song called Let Bygones Be Bygones. I think I heard it. They played it for you? Yeah, listen to it. So it's a record where I'm reflecting on all of the great times that I had on Death Row. And I tell you, Death Row was some of the greatest times in my life. And people don't speak on it. They always want to bring up the negative or the bad or the, mm -hmm. the shit that went wrong. But it was more shit that went right than went wrong. And I had the time of my life. I missed that shit. I missed my friends. I miss just being a young kid and not giving a fuck. See, that's what I missed too, but it was crazy, wasn't it, though? It was fucking that's crazy. That's what I missed about when I was young, but I was too out of my fucking mind. But we didn't mind, know it was crazy. Yeah, that's the cold part about it, that we didn't even know it was crazy because we was young and didn't give a fuck. And we all inspired each other. You get what I'm saying? So, like, whenever we watch you fight, we was inspired. Whenever you heard our music, you was inspired. It's like it was real. A, a, a commitment to excellence, to us being there for each other. Like a brotherhood, something that we forged. Like, you would think that our mothers and fathers knew each other the way we bonded. But we did that shit on our own. On some real shit. And that's when hip hop was reaching its um, pinnacle. It was, it, was. it was at its best. Hip hop was at its purest. It was at its best. You had lyrical people, you had people that was conscious, you had fun rappers, you had hard rappers, you had political rappers. You had everything that you needed for, from hip hop at that time. And then the music I hear now, there's only certain groups I dig right now, because I don't understand some of them, the lyrics, right. you know? Right. There's certain groups I really dig. But see, that's because their music is for the young generation. When we was coming up, our music was it's for us, because yeah. we was the young generation. They didn't really understand it when we was dropping it. You know, they was into the old school music, but we had to show them, look, this, this new shit, you're going to like this, just keep listening to it. They said, fuck the police, nigga. Man. Fuck, that blew my mind. When I was young, I was fighting. But how many years had motherfuckers wanted to say that but couldn't say it? You get what I'm saying? For real. So that's what it is. That's what I love about hip hop. Hip hop is the voice for the voiceless. For those who can't speak, let hip hop do it for you. Mike, who was one of your favorite hip hop groups of all time? Run DMC. Wasn't them both? They was the shit. I, I just told somebody the other day, I performed with them in 1992. 94 on stage, and when I seen them perform, I never wanted to perform again like I was performing. I had to step up to another level, because they, the way they performed, they had that power, the energy, fuck, boom, they through the your crowd. face, yeah. They fucking controlled the crowd. Real MCs. Damn, run DMC. Then LL came after that. LL is the shit. We were just talking about LL. He one of the greatest in hip hop. He need a movie. They need to do a movie on him. Yeah, that's gonna be interesting. You know, he, he come from a fighting family. The family from fight. I'm talking Boxers? about way back in, in slavery time. For his, real? His fighters were champions. He has um, a great legendary great uncle that was a fighter. He fought Bell Knuckle. He beat everybody in America. He's an American champion. He's rec he, you know, he, he documented. He's an American champion. So LL Cool J bloodline is fighting. Yeah, and then he had another uncle that was a light heavyweight champion. He even fought Joe Lewis. Two champions in his bloodline, <clears throat> from slavery time and for um, in the early 60s. 20th century. Damn, that's crazy how hip hop and boxing and sports are so connected. Yeah, it all needs each other. Because you know, back in the beginning of time, the only people that hung out with just like the, the fighters and the entertainers, and they couldn't go nowhere. They're black. They only go to one place to go out, so they all got familiar with one another. Right, right. That had to be crazy though, back in the days like that. In the 80s, was boxing more about money or was it more about the fight? They started making a lot of money, but it really is more about the fights. Getting these two best fighters at the time, let them fight each other and see who's the best. No matter what? Yeah, no matter what. And putting them in there and just letting them be gladiators and go. Yeah. Because the guy, like your first 20 fights were against some tough guys. It's just you was just a little bit tougher. You know, I had a good teacher. Right? I had this old Italian guy named Custer Amato, and that's all we did was 
fight, fight, fight. I even quit school. I got kicked out of school for fighting and stuff. <laughs> so I used to, after that, I used to dedicate on fighting, fighting. He even hit, we used to be hitting, he used to hypnotize me, give me a hypnotist, he used to hypnotize me when I was like 14, all the way till I was champ. You know, he used to go through that process. He used to focus totally on fighting. So the hypnotism makes you focus on one thing and one thing only. Yeah, you know, you have to adapt, be able to adapt to it. Like you have to give your whole body up. You have to yeah, give your whole. Yeah, yeah, you're hopeless. It's boom, subconscious, all about the subconscious. So you learned that at an early age. Yeah. So that's why when you was fighting, it was like, how did you feel? What was your spirit like fighting? Was you like tense? Was you loose? Was I'm very you... relaxed, very controlled, but my intentions were really to hurt somebody. Because I noticed how like <clears throat> in your early fights, you would fuck somebody up, but then you would be gentle as fuck at the end of the fight. Like, you know, I just want to. It was over. It like, was over. And there was some... I never understood how the fuck you could beat somebody ass and then all of a sudden you just be gentle as fuck. Like, you know, hey, I'm gonna think it was a great fight. And you just beat my ass. The fuck is you talking about? Yeah, I was cool because there was some big ass niggas. I didn't want to get mad after the fight. I'm like, fuck, I didn't want to fight them after the fight. I'm like, fuck. So that's part of it. The hypnotism was a part of that too, as far as oh, teaching yeah. the control. Be control, intelligent, savage animal. Yeah. Control, intelligent, savage animal. I never fucking heard it like that. That is brilliant. Because that that's ex explains your boxing style. In the beginning, that's exactly what it was. Yeah, Very controlled. You know, um, in boxing, um, my objective, the objective of people that want to see boxing, they want two people that want to really hurt each other. That's what you want to see, right? Right. You don't want to see one guy chasing the other guy. You want to see two guys that mother it's one of yeah, yeah. Can't wait to get a hold of one another. And that makes good fights. Great fights. Who right now is moving your radar in the boxing world? Listen, right? He a little shit talking guy, but he a badass guy named Giovante Davis. I know exactly. You ever hear about that him? little motherfucker bad. I like it. That little motherfucker, he talk plenty shit. He bad. He got to fight this guy, the, um, the, the, um, the, the, the Ukrainian guy. He got to fight him? The Ukrainian guy, the badass. Limachenko. Lim Lim yeah. That's his weight class. And he's good too. I want to see him fight. I don't think he's ready for him now, but another two years, that's going to be a good fight. That could be a super fight for a lot of money. So, out of, out of your fights, Lennox Lewis, Evander Holyfield. What about him? Which one gave you the most problems? Fucking um, Holyfield. Why? Because he was. Was he left handed? No, because he's a fucking badass, right? And he's a fucking counter puncher. Oh, so he wait for you to punch. Oh, he's beautiful in that, yeah. Okay, so you used to just, you, you used to be in a counter punch. You used to let the motherfucker punch, you faint and do your thing oh, now. No, listen, so you're fighting Holyfield, right? And you go like this, and like, go like this, I go like this, boom. You go like this. Okay, Mike, I'm only 100-something like pounds. Boom. You can't boom. And then, boom, and then, half, and then, go half, boom. Boom. Then okay, go, yeah. boom. Oh, so <laughs> he wait for you to boom, boom. boom. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, this wow. Is this beautiful stuff, but he's throwing them in comedy. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, did did y'all see that shit? He wait for you to hit him, and then he come back with a whoop, whoop, whoop. Oh, beautiful fast, too. It's like, and you so happy to get yours off, but you ain't realizing that you didn't gave up two or three. Oh, he's he bunching good, too. Fuck. I thought it was Lennox Lewis because he was longer and, and taller. Nah, nah. You can get up under that. Yeah, but nah, he's just, um, Lennox Lewis is a great fighter, too, right? Um, what's because he's a better combination puncher. Holyfield? Yeah. He give you more of it. Those more punches. Yeah. Okay, okay. There you go, champ. Shit, I wanted to know, man, because I'm like, man, the champ didn't beat some motherfuckers up, but these two fighters right here just seem like I want to know what was the strength of them against you. They were coming up and I was coming down. Exactly. You know? That's what the fuck I mean, though. But that's why the, the trainer, the coach in the corner, all yeah. that shit matter. That keeps you up, right? Yeah, but those guys are great fighters. You can't take nothing away from them. Right. These guys work hard, you know? They broke their fucking ass. Right. And nobody gave them anything. And their eyes was on you anyway. Yeah. You was the prize. How did it feel being the most hunted after you first, first when you first came out, you had to hunt everybody, then you became the most hunted? That's very interesting you would say something like that. You know what? Because um, when you're a young guy, you're hungry, you come and you fight anybody, you broke, you don't have no money, you want glory, you want people to, you want your name to be proud, your mother, your family, your dead, alcohol, whores, or pimp, you want people to be proud of them. And you say, fuck, I'm going for it. And um, fuck, you just say to yourself, man, I made it, right? And then you want more. It's something else you want. It's always something else you want. You want more. You, you want, after you want that, you want the glory. Mm -hmm. Then you want the money. Mm -hmm. Then you want the, 
the attention, then you want the bitches, then mm -hmm. you want the cars, then you mm -hmm. want the house, then you want the plane, then you want, you just want to know you become a glutton. Well, mm -hmm. that's who I was. That's just who I was. You want the fucking cocaine, too. Everything that comes with it. Everything. You want to just fucking be a glutton. You want everything. Everything. But to me, when you come from nothing, what's wrong with wanting everything? You got to be controlled, you know? That's the key. Like you said, a controlled, savage animal. Yeah. You have to be that same controlling person with your life because you're an animal outside of that ring as well. But if you don't stay disciplined, you, gotta, that's, you know, our instincts is the streets. If we don't stay disciplined, that's where we're going to go, right back True. to the streets. True. I think yeah. when, when, when you got locked up and got out, did that give you more discipline? Because it seemed like you, yeah. you, came, you came into some sort of uh, vision of a different mic. I was really bitter. Mad. And angry, yeah. I was really bitter and angry. And when everybody know I'm still the fucking best, fuck you. Mm, that was your spirit? Yeah. Wow. And how'd you get rid of that spirit? Time. You know, life humbles you. Times. Yeah. Time, experiences. Yeah. Things that happen. Just live it. Keep living. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've seen, I seen it all, champ. I've seen you at your highest moments. I've seen you at your medium moments, at your lowest moments. I'm just glad to see you back on the high. Yeah, I'm just happy right to now. be at living, man. I ain't man. fucking around no more. Right. You know? Right. Got my shit together with my family. Right. You know, I'm working harder than that. Right. And you're doing what you want to do, because you want to do it. Got awesome business. Got awesome business partners. Kicking fucking ass. I come to work seven days a week, yeah, though. I come to work. That's what we do. Mike, your um, one-man show. Fucking amazing. Thank you, bro. Fucking amazing. Thank you. My wife wrote that for me. Are you serious? Yeah. That shit was... He went was... and saw Chad's commentary of Bronx Tale. You remember that movie? Yes. Oh, he saw the stage, and I said, baby, I think I can do that. Because, you know, when I'm in Europe, I pretty much I talk on stage, but people are asking me questions. I just do it like Mr. Palmentary do it. Mm -hmm. And don't ask questions, just be theatrical about it. And we, we tried it, and at first I said, this is going to be crazy, right? And then I did it. And I did it. People started laughing. And then I ran back to my wife and said, baby, what's up? We're fucking up on because I, I, it wasn't meant for people to laugh. Right. It was meant to be grimy right. and hunting like hard. And then I said some shit. People just started dying laughing. Right. And so we just made a comedy out of it. But it's the shit because in all shit that's drama, you got to have some fun in it. You got to have some comedy. Yeah. We laugh through our problems. I like your fucking cartoon. Oh, man, that's <clears> another story. That you know? motherfucking cartoon is the shit. Listen, Snoop, I fucking love Snoop, it. I tell you about this. Listen, I'm in my house in Vegas, and these white guys are at the door. <laughs> so these motherfuckers just at the door. And I'm like, you know, I don't know how they even got in. They had to call again, <laughs> so they entered the door, and I, then my cousin, I said, yes. I thought they were feds. I didn't know what like, they okay, were. I said, so what's what happening? Do because nobody rang my door. I rang the phone to let them in. So um, I'm talking to them, and they're talking about we wanted, where, where they're from, and they want to do... Um, a fucking cartoon. I don't think that. I said I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think I want to do that. What? And he said I didn't think so either. I said okay, let's see us try. So I went there and they did a few funny looking sketches and stuff, and I didn't like the way it looked. And then I tried it. I said um, I saw it moving. And I saw the cartoon act. And I said wow, this shit is fly. And then I, I really I, I got into it then. Man, that shit is some of the dopest, funniest, flyest, creative shit I've seen in years. I love. I had no idea. I said these guys in the studio must know what they're talking about. Then, because I said no, I didn't want to do it. I thought it'd be whack, cartoon Mike on a cartoon. What the fuck, I'm gonna be on a cartoon? So they made it like um, Scooby Doo and the A Team got together. That shit is dope. But but how do people respond to it? What's the feedback? Everybody loves it. They loving it. Everybody loves it. Yeah. No negative shit. No, nah, not so ever. See, that's what we we always think that shit ain't gonna be right, and it be the shit that be the greatest shit ever. I have no idea. We are worst critics. You yeah, know that, right? Absolutely, because we seen bad shit. So what you doing movie wise? Because I fucking loved you in the IP. Remember when I seen you at the premiere that yeah. night? Yeah. Um, I'm doing a show right now. It's, it's something like um, Curvy Enthusiasm. Remember that show? Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's called Rolling with the Punches. Russell Peters is one of my assistants. And we're, we're cultivating the cannabis business. Mm. And during that process, we got some, you know, I mean, enigmas to deal with, some quagmires and all that shit. Yeah, they in the way. Baby mamas, drama. All that bullshit. Now, on the movie tip, I see you do a lot of martial arts now. Like, you boxing, but they, they implement some martial arts now into your yeah, shit. Yeah, So are you really practicing, or is it just for the no, movie? No, no, that was um for the movie. That, that just happened. You know, we that just, shit was dope as fuck. Then the clock went off. Ding! Oh, 
shit. That shit was so yeah, cool. Yeah, it was really good. I won the award for the, um, the new artist of Asia. That was hard. Then I seen you in the kickboxing one. Yeah, I did that one too. I see you fucking it up, Mike. You get you getting more and more into it, like doing other shit. Like that's what it's supposed to be. Like never be in a box. Like I realized that as I got older. You know, when I was younger and I was going through my adversity and bankruptcy and all that bullshit, I was like, well, how am I gonna do this? And I'm tired every day. My nose fucked up. I don't know how this shit's gonna. I can't stop. I was right. like, how this shit gonna? How the fuck this shit gonna stop? When this shit gonna be over? The one day, um. Shit, yeah, stop. I wanted to stop this shit. You you stopped on your own or somebody made you stop? Nah, I stopped on my own. My help from my Self-discipline. wife. Self-discipline? Yeah. And your wife? And my wife, yeah. It take that. It, it got to be self-inflicted first and foremost. You got to want it more than anybody. But look at it now. Look how shit is flowing now. Like, you, you just think about, like, man, I had all this money, all this shit, but now you got all this peace and all this happiness, which means more than that. That's so incredible, incredibly right, you know. Never knew by doing this, I'd be like, I, I, the money I made in boxing is nothing compared to what we've been making and stuff. You own this. You didn't it's own incredible. it. No, not at all. It's a big I difference. was owned. Exactly. I was owned. It's, it, boy. I was owned. That's the ownership, slave ship in the beginning. Once we learn how to own our own shit, then we want to own our shit. Not ownership, yeah. we want to own our own shit. This is living now. Now you finally reach the pinnacle of living. You reached the, point of, the pinnacle of boxing many years ago. Now you reached the pinnacle of living when the things that, are, that matter the most are in the right perspective and they, your priorities are in order. And we were too young with all that money. We were too crazy and young. How they gonna give all yeah. these niggas all this money at the All this today? fucking money, hundreds of millions. Of that. Let's look where it's like 20 we young kids, all this money. We had nobody to guide us and no money. Don't no take that money trained spend you that. How to spend, No one trained you how to spend the money or save the money. All that money, nobody's gonna say, well, Mike, put this on the side. We just got this, we free with all this stuff to do what we want with it. But we, hey, when we live our life like rock stars and we live it out the way it's supposed to be lived, we <laughs> live it, man. Crazy. Hey, that's the history books. You can't rewrite that. That shit is what it is. Snoop, listen, let me, let me get personal with you since we're talking, and that's the past. How you live like that, people people out for your head, and you're on the street living, going to the studio, people know where you're at, you gotta deal with beef. What's, you know, what's that like? You have to make money, you gotta move places, they know you're gonna be there. You know what that is? That's like, that's like my father being in Vietnam. Like knowing your life could be took, but fuck it, I gotta go get it, I gotta survive, I gotta get to tomorrow. And that's what it was always about with me, I gotta get to tomorrow. I don't give a fuck about all these obstacles and none of this shit that I'm dealing with. I'm trying to make it to see tomorrow. And the only way I can make it is through survival. I gotta survive through all of this shit that I'm going through. I wanna see tomorrow. You were like, you were the only um, Cripping that's the sea of blood. I know. How was that? It wasn't hard because it was a mutual respect, but at the same time, whenever they homies would come around or whenever certain situations would arise. You hear that shit? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know how it is. It's always yeah. the third party. It's never the first. It's always the second or the third. But through the grace of God, I was found by Master P, and Master P plugged me up and took me away from that and gave me a whole new life, and he taught me business. See, when I was on death row, I just learned to show. Great rapper. But I didn't know how to be a businessman. Master P showed me how to own my own shit, create my own record label, to make movies, and to be a CEO. Like, I didn't even know what a fucking CEO was. Like, I just was so used to being a hoe. Being hoed out, like, being the rapper. You don't have to be the hoe. You can be the pimp. You can be the record label. You can put your own music out. You don't have to have somebody. And being a hoe, it feels good, but you don't produce anything, huh? Man, yeah, we all come out as like good. Yeah, yeah, it's like good feeling. They hoe us out. To show for it. They hoe us out till they show us out. And then you got to realize and know what your position is. Either you're going to continue being a hoe or you're going to be a pimp. Right now, you pimping the game right now. This has no hoe on it. You own this, you own that, you're running this, your businesses. But when you was a boxer, it's kind of like you was a hoe because... You gonna fight this, you gonna do this, and you gonna give me your money, you gonna do this, and you gonna be left with that. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, nah, hold on. I call the shots. I, I plan everything. Everything goes through me. If I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna do it. You get what I'm saying? Dang. It's a cold game the way we have to go through what we go through to get what we get. You Look gotta, what we you gotta be cold to get what you get. Mm. Mm. Champ, how was your relationship with Muhammad Ali? Awesome. Wasn't he the greatest man? Incredible. It's, you know, you, they're not going to make gods like him no more. Man, I, I mean, that, that's, 
That had to be great for you, man, once you became champion and Muhammad Ali didn't know who the fuck you was. So dig, right? I'm fighting Larry Holmes and so... Oh, I'm, I heard about that story. Tell him the story. So I'm fighting Larry Holmes. I'm, I'm, I'm 14 or 15. So me, my mentor, Cuss, and Kevin, and some of the boxers, we go to Albany, New York. It's like 30 miles north. And we go to this thing and watch the fights on the screen. Watching Holmes versus Ali. Yeah, and I'm watching this, and um, we, Ali starts going, ah, Ali, and everybody in the, um, the studio, a couple hundred people, say, ah, Ali starts screaming. We were off Ali. And then we watch Ali, um, Holmes beat the shit out of him. Because he was old. Him. Yeah, right? And we were all, I was, we were all crying. Everybody was fucked up. Oh, it broke your heart like yeah, that? Yeah, we were crying. Ooh. I know you, I, that's why you beat the dog shit out yeah, of him. Yeah, we were crying, man. Do y'all understand what this means? That means this was a kid watching Muhammad Ali fight Larry Holmes, and Larry Holmes beat him up, and he made him so mad to where he cried to where when he became champ and got that fight with Larry Holmes, and Larry was across that ring. Mike, tell him what happened. Yeah, I, I did with Larry dirty, but Larry was a great fighter. He was an older guy. He was in the same situation Ali was. He was 38 years old. When Ali fought him, Ali was 39. He was 38 fighting a new guy. I was 21. He was 38, you know what I mean? Having fought in four years or something. Now it was his turn. Ali didn't fight in a few years. Same thing. Mm. You know, and Ali, when Ali was fighting, they weren't like that. They didn't have strength and conditioning coaches and nah. stuff. You know nah. what I mean? You're right. You're right. So that stamina wasn't really... Yeah, Ali wasn't there. He really did a number on Ali, too. We were all crying. I can't... Oh, that's just such a bad moment. I don't even want to talk about it. Oh, fuck. Mm. Damn, champ. That's crazy. Who was the greatest fighter you ever seen fight? What? Ali. Champ. Talk that shit. Throw them blows. Oh, Forget it. Mm. What about middleweights? Ray Robinson. Bernard Hopkins is a bad cat, too. The Ops? Ooh, Roy Jones is a monster. Yes, he was. Fuck. I like Marvin Hagler. He was a beast, too. He was, he was you know, it was the 70s, 80s. I liked him. Hag was hard. Um, Bernard Hopkins, even though people, Bernard Hopkins and Roy Jones took that shit to the next level. They did? Yeah. Wasn't Sweepy a middleweight? No, he was like 140 pounds. Sweepy was called. Oh, he was brilliant, man. When we were his kids, he was a master fighter. He was called. I like the way his precision and all that. He had like 400, 500 fights as an amateur. For real? He was a monster, man. Who they took from him? They took a fight from him. Probably, with, who was it? I Chavez? Delahoy or Chavez, yeah, I remember that fight Chavez. too. Chavez. Yeah. Boxing game ain't what it used to be, man. I love it, but I just I just want it to be what it is because the UFC, a little bit more intense. I kind of like that a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, um, is it entertaining? You watch it? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> I fell in love with that shit on some real time. shit. That shit, I fell in love with it, Mike. Like I'm a boxing fan, but once that shit came out, I was like, this is right to it. They got good knockouts. And they get too. to yeah, it. Yeah, they feel about HBO boxing coming to an end. What is what was the reason because of that? Was they losing out to Showtime that bad? I think so. I think Mayweather could have nailed their coffin by leaving the Showtime. Yeah, that's a possibility, too. He left Showtime? He left HBO years ago and went to Showtime. Oh, when he got mad at home, boy? I started Showtime. I left HBO for Showtime. In the beginning? Yeah. They were playing me. Larry, had, Larry uh, what was his name? Larry Merchant was always trying to play me when I was fighting. He did everybody that's like that. Everybody, that. That's why everybody leave, because of that yeah, motherfucker. Yeah, and left to fuck this You was the blueprint. No, I know. Listen, um, they rather kept him than me. I said, saying that either he's going to go, I'm going to go. They said, we can't let I'm gone. That was the best move for you, though. Oh, hell yeah. Hi, I'm Stormy France, and we're bringing you the weather from city to city and titty to titty. Today, we're going to tight squeeze Virginia. It's hard to get in there, but, I mean, if you're hard, you can get in there, so... Yeah, you know, just, just get there. I like the movie that they did on you with uh, Michael J. White. He did a good job. Right? He did a For fucking a amazing job. Right? For a beginning, he did a good job. Now the possibility now Jamie Foxx is going to do it. I seen him do you. Yeah. That motherfucker can do you. That motherfucker can do you. 
I seen him, the nigga that had his whole thing on, he was doing you like a motherfucker. I said, okay. He did it here, right? Yeah, right Yeah, I think he'd be amazing. Did, he have, did you have Jamie here? Mm-hmm. I was so fly back. Yeah, he loved, he, he'd be amazing doing that. Did you give him the insights? Well, he's talking, you know, they, had, they wanted to know about my family and shit, and I thought I was explaining it to him and stuff. Yeah, because it got to be you. It got to be you and they pin. It got to be your shit, the in-depth shit, the shit that people want to know. Like, we want to know. I really want to know about Mitch, the blood green. That story Mitch had me laughing Mitch, like a motherfucker. Listen, Mitch is a very interesting character, right? <laughs> I never met no cat like this before. When I was a kid, I saw him win the Golden Glove. I knew he was an up and coming amateur. Then he turned pro, and he was. So you knew who he was. Yeah, I always knew who he was. You no, know, he was an up and coming amateur. Really, he won New York City Golden Glove. But from New York, so he was a star in the amateur. Right. So he turned pro, and he was a star in the pro. And I was just an amateur. I was like 14, 15. Like a kid. Yeah. And so I, I got became pro, and I won a couple of fights, and then it was time for me and him to fight. Right? And I beat his ass real easy. I was 19 at the time. I beat his ass 10 rounds, <laughs> shut him out, right? And then one day, I'm a little high, I'm smoking, and I was drinking <laughs> back then. So it's around 4 o'clock in the morning. And I say, um, let's go to Dapper Dan to pick up my clothes. Because I was Dapper Dan, early. the clothes? Yeah. Gucci? Was, yeah, in, in, in fucking Harlem at the time, right? This is when he was um, on the street selling clothes. Yeah, on the corner. So I said, let me go to Dapper Dan to get my, my order. Cause I, Got my um, measurements earlier that day in the morning. And it's around 4 and, four and that Dan had 24 hour shifts. Mm-hmm. So I went in there, and so I'm in there and I'm smoking, and we got started talking. Um, Walt Berry was there, you know, the basketball Yeah, Walt Berry from there. St. John. Yeah, so he came in there. So we're all in there talking, we're all talking, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, my face and um, my back is facing them. So I'm talking, and then we're talking, constantly talking, and all of a sudden, Everybody stop talking, and I'm talking, and nobody's talking. And so all of a sudden, I'm trying to turn around, I'm talking, I turn around, fucking Mitch Green is in there. He's in the fucking, the fucking that close? Dapper Dan, yeah. And yeah, you don't even know what's going on. Oh, so I, turn, <laughs> <laughs> I turn around and see this nigga, and this nigga comes down there, what the fuck you doing here, bitch ass nigga? He said that to you? Yeah. And so I'm high, so I'm like, whoa, did he say that for real? And I'm thinking about my, all my fucking Coca-Cola deal. I'm thinking about all my shit. I'm, I'm a, listen, man, I'm a bad motherfucker at the time. I got Coca-Cola. I got fucking Fuji film. I got all this bullshit at the time. I'm a bad motherfucker, you know, at this time. So, um, but for, I'm a nigga, you know, unfortunately, I'm a nigga. And so he happens. came in and he said that, and, he, and, he, and I said, listen, brother, I said some whack ass shit. Listen, brother, because I, I got this white. I'm trying to act white and trying to be, you know, I'm trying Keeping to be. Keeping that business yeah, deal together. Yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get money, you know. I want to be somebody special, right? So I go like this. I said, listen, brother, I already kicked your ass. So why did I say that? Why did I say that? I shouldn't have said no stupid shit like that, right? He said, what, motherfucker? You ain't beat my motherfucker. You think you beat my motherfucker? And y'all robbed me, your bitch ass. You a fag, you bitch ass, hoe ass nigga. Right? He said, you owe me money too, nigga. Where's my motherfucking money? And he did some shit, and I just punched, I just iced him. He said something, I just iced him. I heard he went to sleep. Yeah, I iced him. No, no. He, he woke back up like Freddie. Remember, remember Freddie Myers? He came back up and shit, and we were fighting some more. And, I, and so I hit him, boom, I hit him with a good shot and I knocked him out. I thought he knocked him out, right? So I walked to my car, I'm in a Rolls Royce, right? It's like 87. I see this fucking um, Mitch Green, he gets up and he comes to my car and he breaks my, what is it, my rear view mirror? He breaks the mirror off my Rolls Royce. And he starts hitting my car, right? I open the car and I beat this motherfucker ass and I hit him again in the eye and he was, he was out cold, boom, but his head hit the floor. And that's when I got scared, because you know when you're headed to fucking concrete, that, that could said, be dead. Yeah. And, and then I heard somebody say, oh, shit. And I said, fuck. Mm. And I just got in the car, and I just busted it out. The next morning, we saw Mitch Green in the paper, and he was all fucked up. There he was. That nigga eye was, was this big. <laughs> that nigga left him. He said, Mitch the Blood Green ran into Mike for round 16. <laughs> I need another one of these bong hits. Round three, Mike. Here I go. Go for it. Go and open up one of those. That's what you want to do. Yo, listen though. You ever think how life is gonna be once your product really hits, once they pass the law? That's gonna be a really different life for you. It's gonna be like Seagram's, Marlboro. You know, things or brands of that nature. Yeah, but how you think um how you think you're gonna handle that? I think I'm gonna pass it down to my grandkids. I'm a grandfather now. 
Congratulations, um, brother. Thank you. I want to make sure that my grandkids and generations after me don't have to struggle like mm -hmm. I did and just make sure I leave something for them foundation-wise that, that can outlive me. Come on, Mosley. Come with this slick shit you always... I'm going to read this out for you because there's uh, got some Twitter questions for some fans. Oh, for real? People ask questions? Yeah. Uh, we up here fucked up talking <laughs> shit, man. <laughs> we tweeted it out. Okay, Twitter questions. At Boxer Identity, have any of your Tigers ever given you any problems? No, um, but um, one of my lines gave me around eight stitches. For real? Yeah. Where you bit you at? Um... You know what? No, it's this one. Around here somewhere he bit me. Was he mad or was it an yeah, accident? I, um, I was trying to give him a technical shot. Oh, and he snapped? I fucking bit the shit out of me. He was scared. What the though. fuck was you doing giving him a technic shot, Dr. Mike Tyson? Yeah, he needed it. <laughs> he needed the fucking shot, he's like, sick. <laughs> what I'm saying though, Mike, you know you're supposed to bring somebody in to shoot that shit in the talk. That my line, my I fucking... couldn't wait. I didn't want no one to know I had the fucking cat. <laughs> I didn't have paper at that time. That's right. What is your favorite thing or place to eat when you go back to New York? Listen, I don't go to New York much, right? But when I go there, it's pretty much Mr. Chow. Mr. Chow? Yeah. That's top of the line right there. <clears throat> at Closed Green Skies asked the question, who is the hardest puncher you ever faced? Fuck. Probably Lennox Lewis. For real? Yeah. That motherfucker's hands was this big. One night that motherfucker grabbed my weed and rolled a blunt with one hand. Yeah, yeah. That motherfucker's hand was this big, one of them. Yeah, he's a monster. <laughs> <laughs> Rude boy. Top selector. Illy A. Ghani asked the question, can you tell us some Tupac stories? Um, I'm in prison, so I'm in prison that somebody, um. God comes up to me, some um, Tyson calls me in the room and said, um, it's this young guy, two picks, two, you know, <laughs> he wants to see you, he's not on your list, and um, it's cool to let him in. Something to that effect, and um, we let him in, he came in, I met him. Um, I believe he had wrote me a letter first and asked mm -hmm. me to come in, so um, that's how I met him. So he came in, I met him, and man, this guy has so much energy. This guy had so much energy, he was so pumped, he jumped on top of the table. I said, my, my brother, get down right now, get down. <laughs> you know what I mean? He didn't know where he was. I said, get down, get down. So um, he came out and he said, man, I, mean, I told my mom, you let me in the club. I let him in the club one night. And he said, you let me in the club. We had fun. We rocked the mic. And uh, he was out there talking. And he was just um, he was just an interesting guy, man. He was just special. You just knew he was special. His he was, spirit, He man. was just fearless, man. His spirit was so, like you said, jubilant, like. A lot of people think he just was some tough guy, some mean guy. Oh, so smart. He, he was, was smart, a smart, fun, uh, cracking jokes, smiling, conscious, laughing. Conscious. Man, what a friend. What a friend. But Dig, right? When you really think about where he came from, that fame must have fucked him up, huh? It had to. Yeah, that fame had to fuck him up. Imagine, you know, coming from where we come from like that, and then he comes to the world, and he blows up like that all over the world. Even when I'm in Africa, we're all over Europe, I would, people always say, what was Tupac like? Everybody always asks me that. That is the, the question I get asked the most as well. How was he? How was he? Like, that's the myth. Everybody yeah. want to know how was he, because they didn't get a chance to know that. He's like a fucking god in some places, you know? Like those African children of war, they named the generals after Tupac. I'm General Tupac. They go in the I'm for real. Look at up, General Tupac um, out in the Congos. In the wow. shop in the castle. Yeah, man. I know what you're talking about when they had them young soldiers over yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Round four. Mm. Uh, refill. What did they like that, Mike? Let's get it together. Mm. Tell me. Lord. What a dollar can get you over there. Listen, um, that strip club is so different than ours. Hey, man, you ever do any, um, toad? You ever smoke the toad? Oh, man, the toad. Motherfucker. We got Roscoe's right down the street. In and Out Burger, Denny's, Fat Burger, Popeyes, and Louisiana Chicken. Lord have mercy. Turkey bacon, 
Imagine if a bear was on your back porch in your trash can. Yikes! <laughs> Let him get what he need and let him get on out of there. He only here for the food. Crazy white motherfucker. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> like, no. Yeah. So what's more after it's doing? Like, I mean, about this shit. Man, she's amazing, Mike. I gotta get you on the show to come on the show, man. So he cooks me. Yikes! Yikes! I ain't never seen a motherfucking turkey that had bacon on it. And so I'm trying to figure out where the fuck they getting this turkey bacon from. <laughs> And it's gummy as a motherfucker, so you can chew that motherfucker for 45 minutes. It is, it is. It is that chewy, right? Yeah, yeah, 45 yeah. minutes in there. What you choice? Let me get some of that bubble gum. No, I ain't no bubble gum. That's a target bag. Oh, wow. I'm so, aren't you so happy that you're married now? You settled come now? Come on, man. The, the half of the battle is, is being able to come home to something. Yeah, isn't that a trip? When you out there every night trying to find it and trying to figure it out. Fuck. Getting into arguments and fights, that's Listen, just the worst Dick, shit. I thought I never would be like this in life. I said, no way, I said, I'm gonna be out there fucking till the day I die. I have hundreds of bitches, young bitches. I ain't never thought I'd be this, boom, this is my life for my wife and kids. You gotta never grow in into it. Years. You gotta grow in into years. it, though. Very grateful. Yes. That we didn't reach the demise. Not many people we lost back then. We lost a lot of people back then. No self-discipline. Yeah. A lot of it was, you know, self-inflicted, too. <laughs> Survival is key, y'all. Please pay attention. Self-preservation. Man, pay attention, man. Take care of yourself. Make sure you keeping the right environment around you, the right people around you, the right spirit around you. Because that's very key to who you are and what you are. Vibes. Put some magic on that right there, that. Like some Elizabeth Montgomery shit on Bewitched. <laughs> so this is your cannabis product right here, right? Yes, it is. Flower. I must say, your shit is top of the line, Mike. It's good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Smith. Right Real there. good. You know, I ain't gonna put no, no cut on it. They gave me good views, gave me the cannabis cups, and they made me feel good. They put me in front cover of one of these magazines. I should have brought you in a the magazine. They called Vegas Cannabis. Now, your shit is good, dog. With the shit you asked me last time was bomb as fuck. Mm, he did it again. Oh, no. We're getting ready to do Brian Gumbo and Forbes magazine about our cannabis. Brian Gumbo? Yeah. From HBO Sports? Yeah, we're going to try to get an interview with him about discussing That's our cannabis. I like his interviews. Real sports. I've been watching him since I was a kid. He's been doing it for the longest. Oh, Brian Gumball. We inside the Smoker Studio, Everyday People, AKA Real Nigga Shit. I'm gonna ask you some questions you can answer to the best of your ability. Go for it, dude. What's the first thing you do or think of when you wake up? I'm just happy to be alive, right? Hot or cold? I don't wanna live in the East Coast no more. So he wanted hot. Yeah. Tacos or burgers? Burgers. Ass or titties? Ass. What's your favorite pair of shoes of all time? New Balance. What's your favorite thing to cook? Eggs. <laughs> it's all I could fucking cook. <laughs> What's your favorite cereal of all time? Captain Crunch. With the berries or plain? I do the berries. I like the berries, yeah. What's your favorite cartoon of all time? Mike Tyson. <laughs> How many times a day do you think about sex? Listen, at one time in my life, it was my, my that was all I ever thought about. You know, I don't <laughs> think about it that much now. No, I don't I really don't think about it as much now. What's the worst I'm job you've ever had? I'm not as good as I used to be. Huh? <laughs> What's the worst job you've ever had? I don't know. I was in, jail. I was, um, in prison. I had to sweep the, the gym. Clean the gym. <laughs> Niggas said sweep the gym in prison. Yeah. <laughs> if you were stuck on an island for a year and could only listen to three albums, what would they be? Lauren Hill's album. I don't know, Pac and Biggie. If you could remake any movie and star in it, what would it be? New Jack City, probably. Nino? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nino was a bad motherfucker. New Jack City. Nino said, cancel this bitch. Pour champagne on him. G-Money had to get rid of him. G-Money got mad when 
He called Listen over and answered the phone, and she answered the phone. Shanequa, put Nino on the phone. I knew you was a hoe. Listen, back in the 80s, we had guys like that, you know, in yes. every neighborhood. Yes. Back in the 80s, yes. the, the drugs and the money was Gold flowing. Gold chains and the leather. And they had their crew, and they weren't fucking around. When they pulled up in the club, they had their cars and Respect. their crews and their straps. Respect. And you know, you know, you better go over there and give them niggas five. Respect. Like, we could identify with Nino. It was a Nino Brown in every fucking neighborhood and every place in America. Nino. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Be able to read people's mind. Mmm, mind reader. Mm, that's a special kind of skill. Mind reader. Okay. We're gonna do finish the sentence. I'm gonna start at you finish it. Go for it. I always wake up. Always wake up grateful. If I could box anybody dead or alive, I would want to box. Fuck, I don't know. I don't ever think about boxing anybody no more. In your prime? In my prime? Anybody, you know, my prime want to fight giants, Goliath, Caesar, anybody. Jack Johnson? I know, I never thought about that. I really admire him. I know. That just would have been an amazing fight because yeah. he was a bad motherfucker. I love Jack Johnson. They say he fought four motherfuckers in one day. Listen, but Jack Johnson was a different. Jack Johnson during the time of, you know what I mean? Um, black men couldn't be black no. men. Listen, man, at the height of the Ku Klux Klan, we had no rights. Jack Johnson was eloquent, so he was, he was just very disrespectful to them. <laughs> he was just very disrespectful. He would beat them up and talk to the guy. Still. He said, what do you think? I bet you $10,000 that I'll knock him out in the next round. Oh, he's talking crazy to these people. He goes, I'm going to kill you, nigga. I'm going to hang you. After the fight, you're going to be met by a bullet. They're talking crazy. There's 20,000, 40,000 people. And, and he's him. And he's fucking with them. <laughs> Whoa, Why they ain't told man. his fucking life story? Man, they That's did. the life story. James Earl Jones did his story. It was a good story. If I could see anybody box... Dead or alive, I want to see. Muhammad Ali. Mm. In his prime, right? Yeah. I look for a blank in a woman. I don't know. Dedication, compassion, you know what I mean? If I wasn't a boss, I'd be a... Uh, if I wasn't a boss, I'd be what? You tell me. Uh, you have to finish the sentence. I don't know. If I wasn't doing this right now, I'd probably be doing my... um. International shows, my one man shows and stuff across the world and stuff. That's what I was doing until I got involved with this pretty much. Oh, so this, this put a... I was doing movies and you're, you're traveling in the world getting gigs and stuff. But this is more... This is pretty much hands-on. I'm you gotta be focused there. with it and it's, um, it's paying off pretty well, you know? In a real motherfucking way. Man, much success to you, Mike, man. I'm so happy for you, happy that you got your shit together. And Everything is flowing for you. Your business hand looking strong. You looking good. Got your beard game together looking like Kenny yeah, Rogers. Man. You got to know when to fold them and when to hold them. This is awesome, man. I appreciate being invited here, bro. Mike, you know, we fuck oh, with man. you, man. We family. Uh, we're cut above the rest. Mike is a professional, man. This motherfucker's a professional. Why they give me the zipper and it don't open up? I don't know, niggas. <laughs>